we open up today, if you want to find your place in the Bible, to page 615 with Psalm 131. And let us begin with prayer. Gracious Lord, we are so glad that your spirit is with us. We are also glad that you are at the right hand of the Father to pray for us, but we need you with us. And so we ask that your spirit help us to understand the joyful news of your resurrection that is in the scripture today, that is in, this, that is in the presence of friends and family and church, that is apparent through prayer. Help us to know that you are with us all the time and that we can rely on you. Continue to nurture us as your children of all ages. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forever. We continue our readings in the New Testament with resurrection passages. We began on the first Sunday of Easter with the first passage that was written down, the passage in Mark. And we heard that day how it was that the women who went to the tomb saw that you had risen not by seeing you, but by the fact that the stone had been rolled away and that there was an angel present saying that you had risen. Last week, the second week, we heard of the women again. We heard of the angels that came to tell them the good news, and we learned that they went back and told that good news to the disciples. We also learned that Peter had run to the tomb to see himself with his own eyes, whether you were there or not whether Jesus was there or not. And he saw that he was absent. Then we heard of a journey on the road to Emmaus where it was the first visitation, apparently, the first time that you had appeared as the resurrected Lord to Cleopas and his friend. And in the time that they journeyed back to Jerusalem, we hear that you had apparently appeared to Simon Peter. So, so far that we know of, there were two resurrection accounts, two sightings of Jesus. And we're glad to hear that. We pick up now at the end of that story when those stories were being shared among the 11 and among the two who had showed up and probably others. We pick up where we left off. We're at Luke 24 and we begin we're going to repeat the end of the passage we read last week and continue until verse 49. So at verse 33, the two, Cleopas and his friend, got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. 
A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in this city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Touch me and see, Jesus said. He gave them this invitation to touch him and see. Remember, we began with the stories of how the angel told of him and the women saw the angel but did not see him. How in Emmaus, he had disappeared from their eyes, seeming not to have a body, seeming not to be in full flesh. And here in the passage, it says that when they did finally see him, verse 37, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. To help them understand that that was not the case, He said to them, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see, I have. We all learn to see not just with our eyes. We have been given five senses. We see, that is understand, comprehend with all of them. We've been given all the senses to use, and one is touch. In educational learning styles, it is called tactile learning. Learning through touch, through feel, through experience. See, touch me, and see, Jesus says. My children, after they grew past the age of their blankies and Of course, I was reading to them when they were in the womb. But I began to get touch and feel kind of books. Any of you remember the book Pat the Bunny? Right? And I love the name of Pat the Bunny because how you learned about what a bunny felt like was by patting him. There was fur to touch. And the children would learn by patting the bunny. My oldest daughter... And my youngest daughter both loved to touch. They were tactile learners to a degree. My second more than my first, but my first enjoyed it too. But I taught them at a young age what was called the gentle two-finger touch. Did you ever teach your children that? Because if they pat, patting can be hard. (laughs) So you teach two fingers, gentle two-finger touch. So she was just a small baby, like a one-year-old. I could take her into any store. I never had to use a stroller for her. Never. Never had to hold her hand. She was one of those children, and she, I would teach her the rules, and she would obey them. And I would say, if you want to see something, point to it. Don't touch it. Tell me what it is. Use your words. Mommy, I would like to touch that. I would take it down from the store shelf, bring it up to her, and she would gentle two-finger touch. My oldest daughter didn't employ the same. We had to use a stroller with her all the time, my youngest daughter. 
But they both learned through touch. And do you know that without touch, even if you provide every need to a baby, you provide clothes, you provide shelter, you provide food, that without touch, babies will not thrive. This has happened in orphanages where they would find a place where they'd put the babies in the crib, but they couldn't hold them or touch them. Sometimes the babies would die. We all need touch. And in order for relationships to prosper, we need touch too. How many marriages have you heard that have dissolved because touch stopped? It is very important. When I counsel couples that are coming to me to be married, I say to them, to each other, there's a rule that if either of you think there's an issue, even if one of you thinks and you say it, you have to make a promise and covenant here that you will come for counseling and if needed, you will be referred out. And that includes if you stop touching each other. You're allowed to say, we need to go to a counselor if this can't be resolved because it holds marriages together. It's a super, a super glue. It's a way of learning about each other and loving each other. There's a word in the Hebrew that we know is the word no, the word yada, yada, but it's a word of deep understanding, intimate understanding and touch. Touch is so important. That is the biggest problem when we lose loved ones. When someone we love passes and goes to be with the Lord, we know that they're in a good place. They're with Jesus but we miss, we miss being able to hold their hand and hugging them and kissing them. We miss their touch, not just their sight. We have photographs. We can have sentimental me mementos, but that's why we have to grieve. We grieve from the loss of touch, that ability to, of sensing them in that way. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, one of the reasons why, besides convincing them that he was not a ghost, Touch me and see. I'm not a ghost. This is my body. I am with you. Touch me so you can remember. The best illustration that I could find to this, which is really very pertinent to our church, any of you remember the movie The Miracle Worker? With Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan, her teacher. Well, I thought about getting uh, a clip of the movie and showing it today. But I decided instead, I remembered I had a copy of a book that Helen Keller wrote. Helen Keller, The Story of My Life. And I found out this is very related to our church because our secretary's husband is in the Keller family. Helen Keller is a member of his family. And so I want to read to you parts from this book. Helen Keller was born in northern Alabama in 1880. At 19 months, she suffered an acute congestion of the stomach and brain, most likely scarlet fever, which left her deaf and blind, the book tells us. That is in the preface. Then we move to her writings. And she says, the beginning of my life was simple. That is before the disease. And much like every other little life, I came, I saw, I conquered, as the first baby in the family often does. She goes on to say, I am told that while I was still in long dresses, I showed many signs of an eager, self-asserting disposition. Everything I saw other people do, I insisted upon imitating. At six months, I can pipe out, how do ye? And one day, I attracted everyone's attention by saying, T, 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 quite plainly. Even after my illness, I remembered one of the words I had learned in these early months. It was the word water. And I continued to make some sound for that word after all other speech was lost. 
I ceased making the sound wah-wah only when I learned how to spell the word. She continues, I cannot recall what happened during the first months after my illness. I only know that I sat in my mother's lap or clung to her dress as she went about her household duties. My hands felt every object and observed every motion. And in this way, I learned how to know many things. Soon I felt the need of some communication with others and began making crude signs. She says it is at this point that she goes on to have Anne Sullivan a few months before her seventh birthday to become her teacher. And she recalls the famous scene that we've seen of the water pump and the miracle worker, if you've seen the movie. She describes this. Earlier in the day, that is she and her teacher, Ann Sullivan, had a tussle over the words mug, M-U-G, and water, W-A-T-E-R. Miss Sullivan had tried to impress upon me that mug is mug and that water is water, but I persisted in confounding the two. In despair, she dropped the subject for the time, only to renew it at the first opportunity. When that opportunity came, she brought me my hat, and I knew I was going out into the warm sunshine. This thought, if a wordless sensation may be called a thought, made me hop and skip with pleasure. When we walked down the path to the well house, attracted by the fragrance of the honeysuckle with which it was covered, someone was drawing water, and my teacher placed my hand under the spout. As the cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled into the other hand the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. I stood still. My whole attention fixed upon the motions of her fingers. Suddenly, I felt a misty consciousness as if something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then the W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. There were barriers still, it is true, but barriers that could in time be swept away. I left the well house eager to learn. Everything had a name, and each name gave birth to a new thought, As we returned to the house, every object which I touched seemed to quiver with life. That was because I saw everything with the strange new sight that had come to me. Jesus said, touch me and see. And Helen Keller, through her teacher, Ann Sullivan, learned how. You need to know, if you ever have a chance to read the book, because she also describes she was a strong woman of faith. At one point, Jesus touched her, touched her heart. This woman who contracted the disease at a young age and was blind and deaf could see, could see who Jesus was and how much he loved her. Jesus said to the disciples that day, Touch me and see. You'll hear next week, though, we can't touch him in the same way, but he still wants us to see. So he tells the disciples that day, touch me and see. But why do they need to see? Why do they need to understand? Why do they need to comprehend? Why do they need to touch him and actually know that he is risen with his body, with a resurrection body? He tells us, if you still have your Bibles open, he tells us. 
He tells us that he wants them to be sent. He tells them that they are to be witnesses. Verse 48. What kind of witnesses? What is a witness? A witness in the courtroom is called not just a witness, but an eyewitness. One who has seen. One who can have testimony that holds true in a court of law in order to be able to validate what is true and not true. He wants us to be able to see at that level so we can be expert witnesses and eyewitnesses that we know through our experience of him and he wanted the disciples to be the same. And so he gave them examples of what they would have to witness to. Some already took place through the scripture and the fulfillment of the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalm he describes in verse 44. He tells them what is written is the Christ will suffer. By this time, had he already suffered? Is there verifiable evidence that this has happened? We know it has. It's the Good Friday story. And then he tells us that Christ will rise from the dead on the third day. He's standing there. They're able to touch him and see the evidence that he has risen. And so because they have been able to see, witness his suffering, and witness his rising, they would be able to be witnesses as they are sent out into the world to tell the story. And why did all this happen? He continues in verse 47. For the repentance, he's going to be sending the Holy Spirit to convict us for repentance, and thereby forgiveness of sins. And this is what we are to witness to. This is what we are to preach as we go out of here. We are to preach to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. We just taught this on the Tuesday class beginning at Jerusalem, going to Judea, going to Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. You have been raised up, dear children of God. Dear people of Menden Church, your eyewitness is through the word. But you are to give testimony and witness of Christ's suffering for you, for forgiveness, and of his rising. He's not a dead God. He is a living Lord. The faith is alive because Christ is alive. We're not just here based upon tradition. We're here based upon truth. And you are witnesses. And you're not just to come and stay here to listen and hear it. Faith comes from hearing, yes. But you're to take that faith into the world and tell it. And show it in the way you live. Because guess what? Though the world cannot touch and see Jesus, they can touch and see you. You are his body. He said that I have come and done great works, but you will do greater works than these. You are the body of Christ for the world to touch and see and know that he is alive. So you're being fed today with things to hear and things to know. And you can go out in the world and bring back your friends and say, come and see what I have seen. Come and touch what I have touched. Come and be a part of the faith. Because compared to the things in the world that we can touch and see, it is the most real of all. Praise be to the Lord, Jesus Christ, living and risen. Amen.